Ali May, can you hear me? I can see you now, so uh, I think it might just have been slow. I, I can hear you now. Can, can everybody else, can everyone just sort of put a thumbs up in the chat just to make sure? Yeah, perfect. So I've given a little introduction already, Justin. So I guess it's just over to you. <laughs> Great, thanks. And apologies for everyone being a little bit late today. Um, it's a very fast moving uh, space at the moment, particularly around the, uh, the rollout of the lateral flow testing. And I'll talk a little bit about that with you uh, today. I'll give a little bit of update on where we are on, on the vaccines. Um, but I'll start off by talking a bit about where we are in terms of uh, the case numbers and the latest uh, data that we're seeing. So in terms of our uh, current uh, case rate in Birmingham, uh, we're running at about 191 uh, cases per 100,000. Um, and that's quite a, a big drop. We have really started to see the impact of the national restrictions a couple of weeks ago uh, starting to play out now in terms of the case rate uh, across the city. And that's what we would expect to see. Normally when you see, uh, when you have an intervention like restrictions, then it takes two or three weeks uh, for that to play out in the case numbers. And then about another two weeks after that, you start to see uh, the impact in terms of hospitalizations coming down. So that's exactly the pattern that we, we're seeing. Um, when we look at the spread of cases uh, across different demographics in the city. We've seen really impressive drops in the over 65s, which is probably the age group that I'm most concerned about. This is the group that's most likely to end up in hospital if they catch COVID. Um, and that case rate is now down to 156 per 100,000, where a couple of weeks ago, we were just over 300 cases per 100,000. So it's almost halved uh, in about the last two weeks, which is brilliant news. The highest case rate remains the 30 to 44 year olds. Um, and that's come down. It's now down to about 269 cases per 100,000. Um, but it's still quite a lot above. Um, for example, the case rate for 0 to 15 year olds is only 129 cases per 100,000. So that 30 to 44 year old age group, we've still got to do quite a lot of work um, to get them down, I'm afraid. Um, what we're seeing in terms of the uh, ethnic dimension uh, of this is we're seeing uh, the proportion of new cases rose over the last uh, two weeks in our Indian community. We saw a particular uplift uh, in the week of the 26th of November. Um, and uh, we've also seen an increase in our Black African and Caribbean community. Uh, over the last few weeks as well. So that's gone up slightly. Um, and that is a bit of concern, but I think some of that reflects the different pictures we're seeing across the, the wards of the city. Um, overall, we've seen about 26 wards out of the 69 that have now seen a statistically significant reduction in cases, which is really, really good news. Um, and I particularly want to give a shout out to Lazelle's, um, who've had really impressive drop um, in terms of the case rate. Um, I think it's a combination of a couple of weeks ago, there was focused enforcement activity, good community engagement. The local elected member was, was doing a lot and making people really aware. So there was some real drop down um, in those areas, which I think is really helpful. Um, on the infographic you've had this week, you've seen that there was a rise in three, three areas. Um, in uh, two of those areas, that rise relates to specific situations where we've got outbreaks in care homes um, or other institutions. Um, one of those areas, um, we can't explain like that. So particularly want to see, um, you know, pulling down the rates a bit more in areas like Hansworth, which haven't been turning the corner in the same way that some of the other wards have. Uh, in the city and and you know Hansworth's got a challenge because it is quite a small ward um, so actually for it to get its numbers down you know it's dropping down from uh, 34 cases um, it really needs to get that down to kind of 10 or 15 to to really show the decrease um, so I think that's why Hansworth's struggling a bit more than, than some of the other areas um, the other ward we've seen a really impressive decrease is Heartlands so Heartlands have gone down from 78 cases to 44. So really pleased to see that coming down. Um, 
So yeah, so I think where, where you have seen the, the areas in the infographic with high numbers, of two of those we know exactly what's going on. Hansworth, I think it is still um, reflecting the, the challenges we have around um, particularly visiting. And what we've seen in the contact tracing information is that the majority of contacts that are identified are from people, um, either people they share a house with or people visiting each other's house. So that's the, the kind of key thing we, we're still seeing, unfortunately, despite the regulations, is that some people are still popping in and out of each other's houses um, when they know they shouldn't. Um, but that's what's spreading the virus. Um, we've seen in terms of the outbreak picture, we are seeing, unfortunately, more cases in care homes. But some of that's because we're looking more because we're doing this routine testing in care homes. Um, but we have seen an increase, particularly in staff in care homes, testing positive. Um, we are seeing, continuing to see more workplaces. Um, but I think what's good in Birmingham is what we tend to see is that the majority of outbreaks, small number of cases, the business talks to us quickly, we get in, we do more testing, we give the right advice and it stops there. So what we're not seeing is outbreaks really suddenly exploding. We're getting in much earlier and that we need to keep that going on. So that message that, you know, if a business has two or more cases, pick up the phone. Because the sooner we can give you the right advice, the sooner you can get it under control. And, and I think that's a really, really important point to, um, to get across. Um, so I think that's probably what I'd say in, in terms of the, uh, the case numbers. So I'll talk next a bit about testing. Um, so I think, as I said last time, but I'll go over it again. Um, the, um, there are three types of tests you can have. So antibody test. Um, you can only get that privately or if you're part of a research study, the NHS at the moment. We know that natural resistance, uh, so your natural antibodies, if you've caught COVID, wears off quite quickly. So um, generally, I think that's a waste of your money. I'd avoid it. Um, second test is PCR test. So swab to back of your nose, back of your throat. Swab goes off to the lab, gets put into a fancy bit of kit. That's very good at finding very small amounts of the virus. So if you've got COVID, it will find it. And it's very accurate at finding the virus. Um, so we use that in people that have got symptoms and we need to know, is it COVID or not? So that we can um, give them the right advice and their contacts the right advice. The third type of test is the new lateral flow test. Same swab to the back of your nose, back of your throat, but this time you give that swab to a technician in a testing center, they mix it with some liquid, they put it onto a little cartridge bit of machinery, um, and that reads the result. Now, the lateral flow test is best at detecting when there's loads and loads of virus on your swab. So it's most effective at picking up whether you're infectious or not, but it's not very good at picking up the virus when you're in the first couple of days of infection or you're not particularly infectious. So the way I kind of describe it is PCR tells you, have you got COVID or not? Lateral flow tells you, are you infectious or not the day you take the test? So those are the, the tests at the moment. Um, lateral flow is being used in terms of uh, well, a couple of different ways. So national governments working directly with care homes around rolling out for care home visiting. Um, and that's slowly building up because you've got to train people to use the test um, uh, and uh, train them how to read it, all of that. Um, it's being used with universities to support students to go home, uh, test before they leave the city to go home. And it will be used in the spring before they come back for the start of the spring term as well. So that's uh, the second angle to it. There's uh, some pilots of using lateral flow in whole school testing, which is being done between government and a series of schools. Um, and that's a pilot at the moment. I don't think there are any plans to roll that out before the Christmas term ends, but they might start to see that in the uh, beginning of next term. And then the fourth element that national government's working directly with services on is the testing of NHS staff using lateral flow. Um, and again, they're doing that directly. 
So the bit that the council's responsible for and is working with the Department of Health on is how do we um, roll out more access to lateral flow testing in a targeted way. So the pilot in Liverpool showed that if you just try and test everyone, that doesn't really work. It's not a particularly effective use um, of the test. Whereas if you think about who you're going to invite for testing and why, um, is it because they're in close contact with other people? So they work in a close contact setting or a, a close contact uh, service? Is it because they're a high risk vulnerable population? So that if COVID got into the community, we'd be very concerned about that. For example, a homeless community or a substance misusing uh, community? Um, or is it people that, for example, uh, work in a close contact workplace? So we're building a testing model um, and a series of hubs and spokes to support that. And I hope next week we'll be able to share that at the Local Outbreak Engagement Board. It's all tied up in negotiations about getting the kits and getting the money from, from government to do it because it's not a small effort. Unlike when we rolled out PCR testing where we kind of chose the site or we helped identify the site and government had already commissioned the staff and the tents and the desks and the cleaning and all of that kind of came as a package. This time it doesn't. What we've been given is a kind of, here's the list of what you've got to do, but you have to recruit people, you have to do it all and um, you know, start from scratch. So it is taking uh, some time to build it, um, but we are getting there slowly and we have a, um, our first hub testing site at the National Arena um, and that's focusing on initially council staff and then public sector staff and will be gradually opening up at the moment over that so that will be moving uh, forward uh, slowly. So that's where we are in testing and I'll just cover off vaccines before I start to work through some of the questions in the chat. So on vaccines, so the NHS are responsible for uh, the vaccine deployment. So unfortunately, much as I think we'd like to in the council uh, be able to influence it more, unfortunately we can't. That is, it is being run very much by the NHS and the decisions on prioritization on who gets the vaccine when, is made by the Joint Committee for Vaccine and Immunisation. So JCVI, that's an independent panel of academics. They look at all the evidence and they say, this vaccine should be used for this population and you should prioritise who gets the vaccine based on the highest risk of death uh, and the most impact of them having the vaccine. So they go through that process. They've been working through it. They continue to revise it so you have seen in the press you know the the group of who's in the first group changes almost daily at the moment and that's because JCVI keeps looking at the evidence but they're also looking at the vaccines themselves so the Pfizer vaccine which has been approved now and is arriving as the first jab happened uh, today um, is very fragile so um, I suppose think of it like a bit like a very delicate egg. You can only move it a couple of times because the more you move it, the more you risk you drop it and it breaks. So it's got to be carried in these frozen containers that kept very, very cold. And each time you move it, it defrosts a little bit. So that's the reason they're quite limited in what they can do. Now, some of the other vaccines like AstraZeneca one, um, don't have to be kept in that kind of fridge. They're much stronger, much stronger vaccines in a sense. So they, once that's approved, then I think we'll see much more vaccination happening in communities through GPs, through vaccination hubs, etc. Um, and that will come over the next couple of weeks. So there's light, but it is going to take a while for us to get to the end of the tunnel. And I think we're going to be in restrictions uh, and this kind of hands face space place um, well until the spring. Um, until the majority of people who are most vulnerable, so those who are over 60, um, those with extreme clinical conditions who are currently shielding, and our staff working in social care and the NHS have been vaccinated and they've had two doses of vaccine because you need both doses to be fully protected. So until all of them have had the two doses, then we really can't take our foot off the pedal. And I suppose that brings me to the final point before I go into questions. The, um, the reason we need to not get too complacent at the moment, although we're seeing the case numbers coming down, which is great, we know that normally we would see hospitalisation rates 
follow about two weeks after our case numbers come down. So at the moment, our hospitalization uh, rates are relatively high. We're seeing about 50 people a day going into hospital with COVID. And because we're getting better at treating COVID, they're not dying quickly, they're staying in hospital, but they're still quite sick. So that means they're blocking a bed. Uh, or they're staying in hospital in a hospital bed, which means you can't put someone who's had a heart attack or broken their leg into that bed. And what the NHS is worried about at the moment is we're now entering that winter time of the year where the NHS is under more pressure because it's cold, it's dark, it's wet and it will be icy and we slip and fall, we trip, we break things, we have accidents, or our mental health is often worse in the winter as well. So all of those things I mean there is more pressure on the NHS normally in the winter and normally coming into winter the NHS has kind of got a bit of bit of flex we've got some some extra space in the hospital and at the moment all of that extra space is full of COVID patients so what the NHS is very very worried about is if we let up too quickly case numbers will go back up again and any spare capacity it's got to cope with all the extra demands of the winter is gone because it's full of COVID. So that's that's the real um, kind of tension point at the moment about you know if we relax too early. Um, and just picking up the first of the questions from Zabar about you know what's the risk about people spreading it during the Christmas period and the Christmas bubble. That's exactly why we're very nervous at the moment because. It, you know, when people mix, even if they are very good and they are sticking to the regulations, if you only mix your household with two other households during that five day period and those two other households fix, so it's you plus two other households, those two other households can't have two other households, the three houses are linked and that's and no one else can mix during that five day period, even with that, that will increase the spread. So we will expect a small an increase in cases uh, about two weeks into January because of the Christmas bubble. So you, if we don't get the case numbers really down to rock bottom, we'll go up from wherever we are, and that could quite easily get us back into the position we were back in in early November when we came into national lockdown. So it is a real concern at the moment. In terms of the advice for what what can we say to people about how can you reduce your risk? So. <clears throat> couple of tips so first of all germdefense.org um, many of you heard me talk about it before but please germdefense.org great website all about what can you do in your household to reduce the spread of infection available in over 60 different languages brilliant resource really helpful on simple things you can do some simple tips i would say um staggy meal times so um, try not to have meals in which the elderly are around the same table as young people. So trying to stagger so that the eldest, most vulnerable people in your house get their meal first and then they go off to the sitting room and then the rest of you eat together to try and break up that risk of transmission around the dining table. Because when we're sharing a meal, we pass things. We pass the salt, we pass the chutney, we pass the, the writer. Uh, and when we're passing them, we've contaminated something and we're giving it to someone else. So that's a real risk. Really important to reinforce hand hygiene when you are sitting down to have a meal. So everyone washing their hands before they come to the table. It's a good thing to do for all those tummy bugs, but it's really important to do for COVID as well. So washing your hands before you sit down to eat with soap and hot water, really important, but also staggering meal times to protect those that are most vulnerable. The other thing that I think is an important tip is try to avoid watching telly together. Um, you know, one of the things we often do at Christmas is the whole family crams in the sitting room and we all sit around and we watch a Christmas movie or the latest Disney classic. Um, and that's unfortunately really great environment for COVID to uh, spread, particularly if we've got the windows closed and perhaps a fire going. It's all warm and snuggly um, and COVID loves that. Um, so really thinking about, you know, actually, how can you stagger a watching TV? How can you make sure that people don't mingle? Um, so I think that's an important tip to, to give as well. 
So I'll, I'll move on to um, some of the, uh, the questions we've got in the chat uh, and pick those up. Uh, so I'm just, there was a question about Summerfield and I'm just trying to find it on my list of uh, awards. So I might have to come back to that one. Uh, yeah, so if someone can just remind me which ward Summerfield is in, then I'll be able to dig it out for you. Um, what I would say is that actually if you look at the data below a ward area, particularly if you're looking at a case, then it gets quite um, distorted because the small numbers effect starts to play out. Um, and that can be where you've got an increase, an, an outbreak, for example. Um, there was a question from uh, Zhu Zhang uh, about vaccine. Uh, will people with a visa be able to get the vaccine? I don't know, actually. That's a really good question. So, um, Holly May, if we can take that one away, we can ask the NHS about uh, that because, as I said, they're leading. And I don't know what the position is. And it'd be good to know also for people who've got no recourse to public funds, for example, uh, as well. Um, can I just remind anyone who's joined us to make sure you've muted um, just so we don't get your family chat in the background. Um, Dan asked about um, the rates of, of virus infection in homeless people. We don't have that data, Dan, I'm afraid. It's not routinely collected. So all we're able to do is get kind of anecdotal data from homeless sector uh, providers. Um, and one of the big challenges for the homeless has been that in order to register for a test, you have to put in things like your national insurance number, your pass passport number. Unfortunately, some of our homeless people don't have that data. And that's been a real barrier, actually, for accessing tests at the moment. Now, with lateral flow, it's a, it's a shorter and easier rest registration process. So I hope that will improve things. But it is something we've been trying to find a workaround for and, and unfortunately struggling with it at the moment. Um, great to hear from Diane. Had a good experience of testing at the Birmingham Airport drive-through site and got uh, tested on a Tuesday, results uh, Monday, uh, and results received on a Wednesday, uh, which is brilliant news. And, and what I would say is there's plenty of slots in our testing sites for PCR at the moment for people who've got symptoms. And it is, we're getting back to the days of you get your results within 48 hours. Um, Soraya asked about uh, COVID vaccine and if you've had the flu vaccine, what's the connection? So, um, flu vaccine does not protect you against COVID. So, whether you've had the flu vaccine or not doesn't make a difference from a co whether you're, you're protected from COVID or not. Where people have got confused is because we know that the, co the COVID vaccine needs your body all ready and good to go. And if we give you another vaccine, like the day before, your body's like learning to learn how to defend against flu. So if we give you a flu jab, your body needs about a week or two to get its head round defending itself from flu. And if we give you another vaccine, particularly the COVID vaccine straight away, body can't cope it's too much to learn so what we what they've decided is that if you have your flu jab you need at least a week or two window between the flu jab and the covid jab and that's to make sure that your body's learnt how to defend itself from flu it's kind of finished that exam it's got its head in the right space and now it can sit down and do the kind of covid test to defend itself against covid so that's why there's been a lot encouraging people who are due to have a flu jab, get on and have it, because we don't want anyone turning up and going, oh, I had my flu jab yesterday, because that's where it becomes a problem. So it's really about giving your body time to kind of learn how to protect itself and not be confused by getting too many vaccines at front. Uh, so Magda's asked about... Um, events so magda i'd say on the on about the polish charity gig um i think if you contact the events team um directly in the council um then they can talk through uh, about what you can and can't do um and um there are i mean there is really detailed stuff actually up on the website uh, uh, and the national website at the moment um, I think I'm afraid a lot of it needs to be virtual, but there is some good news about um, choirs, for example, carol singing can be done outside if it's socially distanced. 
Um, you know, there are lots of things you've got to do risk assessment wise, but um, have a look online. And then if you've got detailed questions, then do come back into the events team in the council. Um, Fiona asked about the vaccine and how long it's lasts. So the vaccine um, lasts, as far as we know at the moment, seems to last uh, for at least a year. And we think it probably will last longer. Um, but we don't know, obviously, because the vaccine's only just been developed, we, we don't know whether people will need a booster shot. Now, for the vast majority of vaccines, um, they don't need a booster shot. Um, but there are some, think about tetanus, for example, we get a booster after 10 years. Um, MMR, we give uh, multiple doses spread out over a couple of years as a child grows to ensure that they've got protection. Um, TB, we don't give a booster for. So, um, and the only reason we give flu every year is because the flu virus is basically pretty cunning and each year it likes to change its coat. So our bodies don't recognize it. So that's why we have an annual flu vaccine. It's not because our body's forgotten how to make the antibodies. It's because the flu vaccine has gone and changed its coat and therefore our body doesn't recognize it anymore. So all the evidence at the moment is that um, we probably won't need another COVID vaccine um, unless COVID changes, but time will tell on that one. Um, but certainly it's not, it, it's, it, we're probably good for a year is certainly what we're, we're being told at the moment. Um, so Mangal asked about schools. Yes, I gather there's been an announcement today. I'm afraid I've been back to back meetings, but um, I think you're right in that the, the minister, school has said to school, school minister, sorry, has said to schools that they should turn Friday the 18th into an inset day. Um, this is more about, I, I think there are two sides to this. So um, we'd already in Birmingham spoken to schools around ensuring that they were contactable if we had a case um, that would happen. Um, so if, if child, children went home on Friday, they developed symptoms over the weekend and got a test on the Monday, we wouldn't necessarily get the results until the Tuesday or the Wednesday. So we would still need to be able to contact them and they would need to be able to contact all of those children and tell them they need to isolate. Um, and if people are isolating, they can't go into their bubbles. So it would have quite a big impact. So what I think the department is trying to do is give the best possible chance to children that they're not going to have to isolate on Christmas Day. But, it, you know, it's more about trying to help families plan, I think, more than, than anything else. So um, I know there's been a huge amount of discussion about it. So in some ways, I'm quite pleased it's come through. Um, but it's more about helping families plan for Christmas than rather than, than families getting a call on Christmas Eve going, I'm afraid your child has to isolate. Um, and that means you can't go and do whatever you're planning to do with your, your other two household bubbles on Christmas Day. So it's trying to, I think it's, yes, it helps the, the schools, but it also helps uh, children and families plan a bit better for Christmas. Um, so, uh, yeah, Fiona's just reinforced that. Uh, Fiona asked about what do we think the impact, what do I think the impact of the Christmas increase will be? Um, I think the, um, I do think we'll see an increase in cases. Um, I'm really pleased that in Birmingham I'm seeing really responsible shopping um, rather than perhaps what I'm seeing in some of the media coverage, but I'm always somewhat dubious about this. Um, we are going to be putting out some information to you. I think it should come out today or tomorrow from the team about how to stay safe when you're shopping. Um, and, you know, it's sensible things. We borrowed it from Herefordshire, who shared it with us uh, very generously. It's some really good ideas about simple tips to stay safe when you're out doing your Christmas shopping. Um, but I think we will see an increase. I think the question is how bad and how big. Um, and ultimately that will will be the question marker but do we go into a national lockdown again um, I think it's also the big thing that they're wrestling with nationally about whether they can relax for any any of us coming out of tier three on the 16th or whether it's better to stay stay in tier three and perhaps some more areas like London come into tier three 
for the next two weeks so that when we do get the impact of the Christmas period, we're as low as we possibly can be so that the NHS has got the best chance for January because January is usually the worst month in terms of pressure on the NHS. Um, Ante asked about the advice um, on Christmas gathering. We'd, we're actually getting some graphics done this week, so they should be with you later this week. And that includes things like the, um, the uh, testing, the, sorry, how to stagger your meal times, not sitting around and, and sharing, uh, watching a movie together, those kind of things. So they'll be out with you shortly. Um, so Summerfield, I'm getting conflicting messages on whether you're in Soho Ward or North Edgbaston Ward, um, but my if, if it's uh, Soho Ward, it's there's a, a very specific outbreak that I can't talk about. And you know, before I've said to you, I won't comment on particular care homes or schools or settings like that. But there is one very big outbreak that we've had um, that's affected Soho and the Drury Court Ward in the institution, which really did skew their numbers for about two weeks. But that's now starting to come down which is uh is really good um alison asked about carol singing so if you go on to the christmas uh guidance i think jack's just put it in the chat there's a very specific bit about carol singing um what i would say is that um you've probably got to shrink the size of your carols because everyone's a uh, carol group a choir sorry um, because everyone's got to be two meters apart to do carol singing and you can imagine the normal choir is going to stretch down the whole street so you probably are going to have to think at some smaller arrangements but um, and it's outdoor only with social distancing um, Magda asked about uh, how similar to flu COVID might be in terms of mutating and responding to vaccine really good question so we know that um, one of the things that, that viruses do is when they get challenged, and basically this means when they realize that we've all got smart and we're not, we're not as receptive to them anymore through vaccination or through getting better at washing our hands, those kind of things, um, they start to mutate. And that's a normal natural response. What we've seen in the, um, the first example of that, which was the mink variation in, um, in Denmark, uh, where the virus kind of went and infected mink and then came back into humans, which is normally, which, that's what flu does, and that's why we get variation in flu, is that the version that came back into humans didn't look like it had changed the bits of its coat that the vaccines are designed to attack. So that was a promising news. Um, we obviously won't know what, what COVID's gonna do, but in general, the coronavirus family doesn't seem to be quite as um, good at changing its coat um, in the way that flu does. So flu is very good because it infects lots of different animals and then jumps back into humans and that allows it to mutate much more. Co coronavirus doesn't seem to. So I think that's, I'm more hopeful at the moment. Um, Councillor Fowler just asked about the length of time after flu jab of the vaccine. So it's, um, it's two weeks, I think, at the moment. They keep changing. It keeps getting shorter. Um, but I think it's currently is a two-week window. Um, so Kate asked about serious... Oh, I think Kate's asking about the um, health conditions that might get prioritised for uh, vaccination in Group 6. So I think we'll get more information over the next couple of weeks because the last version of this I saw was it was talking about uh, people who are currently shielded. So the extremely clinically vulnerable, not everyone that was shielded back in the summer and not everyone that's entitled to the flu jab. But that might change in the next couple of weeks. So priority group six won't be got to um, until the spring. So we've got a bit of a time to find out a bit more about that. Um, Magda asked about how long until we get herd immunity from vaccination. I think it's going to be a long time. So to get to herd immunity from vaccination, you need um, really at least 85 to 90 percent of the population vaccinated. So um, to get to a level where you 
you can control the spread that's over 80 percent so with mmr for example we're running in the city only about 82 83 percent of children have completed their mmr vaccination that's not enough to give kind of herd immunity it's not enough to eradicate the illness in the way that we have for polio for example where we're over 95 percent of children who've been vaccinated so it's those kind of levels we've got to get up to so I think the, it's a better way to think about it is how long will it take us to get the people that are most likely to die or end up in hospital with COVID to get them vaccinated? And once that's done, we'll probably see more freedoms for the rest of us. But to get to a level where we would actually control this um, spreading, we'd, we'd need 80 to 90 percent of people. Um, Jane asked about, is there any plan to introduce mass testing the week before Christmas? um to uh reduce the risk of people coming together and if not is there a risk people will just book tests anyway and overload the system so um no there isn't a plan because bluntly jane we can't get enough tests and we can't get enough people trained up to administer the tests quickly enough um because we only got news we could start to do this from about a week ago so it's you know it's just not possible to mobilize for a city of this size that fast um, and also the tests that we would be using are the lateral flow and the lateral flow all it's telling you is today when you've taken the test you are infectious or you're not infectious you could have still got covid and tomorrow you're going to become infectious all it's telling you is your infectiousness today or not so the PCR tests are the one that are much better at saying, have you caught COVID or not? And there just isn't capacity for everyone to get them before they go home and see mum and dad. What I would say is, you know, one thing you can do is isolate. So if you're able to work from home um, and you are planning to see elderly relatives as part of a bubble, then I would say isolate for the, at least the 14 days if you can before you go home for Christmas. Um, Alison asked about Christmas decorations in individual homes. I haven't seen any restriction on Christmas decorations. I think that one's fake news. I certainly put on my Christmas tree uh, and I don't see any risk from Christmas decorations. If you pass the Christmas decorations around, that's a risk. But if someone's putting them up in a, in a home, I think that's fine. Um, so sue asked about tier review as i said i think it's going to be a really difficult decision sue in terms of do we come out of tier three um and i'm really nervous about what we're seeing in the nhs at the moment in terms of the pressures on hospital beds um you know we and the pressures in intensive care um and it's we're not out of the woods and and you know many of you know i'm a doctor by training I spent many years working in hospitals. January is hard. It's the hardest month of the year for the NHS, you know, in terms of bed pressures. And, and I can really understand how worried our hospitals are coming into that and going, we haven't got any slack in the system. So I, I, I don't think it's going to be straightforward next week. And, and I think it's, it's really just a bit too early to call. And we haven't got enough of a sense from government actually about how they're weighing that up what what you can see in the public domain in terms of where case rates are going and what they can see privately about the nhs and we have asked them about can they do more to put some of the nhs data into the public domain so everyone can understand what's going on um ross has asked about has the vaccination program started here in birmingham no ross it hasn't unfortunately birmingham our hospitals were not um, in the first tranche of hospitals to get vaccines and I know that's something that um, local politicians have been very vocal about um, the leader has been very vocal about local MPs are getting very vocal about you know why why did the second largest hospital uh, sorry largest hospital in the country um, and the second city in the country not get any vaccine um, and I haven't seen any explanation frankly um, and you know I try to stay out of the politics uh, of this um, I hope that they're going to announce new hospitals getting it in the next couple of days. So I, I hope we won't be far behind um, because it's great news. It's coming and, and, you know, we need it as much as anyone else. Um, so uh, Ante asked about as vaccine kicks in, will COVID behave differently 
animals and um, could this lead to changes um yeah i mean it could and that's true for any virus um, particularly true for flu um but covid um we're learning more about what it does with animals um you know the mink was quite a surprise i think for many people we hadn't really thought about that um so one of the things that happened after the mink outbreak in denmark was there was a massive effort by vets across the world to look at the spread of the virus in animals and really just make sure we're not missing any other spread into any other groups of animals so there's now that's kind of come back on the agenda and is being looked at quite closely but we haven't seen anything yet on that uh magda says a uh, question for polish community about how likely despite the vaccine will we go into another national lockdown i have to say i'm i think we probably will at some point have a a period of national lockdown uh next year it does depend a bit on on the kind of post christmas bounce how much we go out uh, go up after christmas um you know if everyone behaves everyone follows the rules we stick to just two other households we don't mix our bubbles we might weather it we might stay down but i'm dubious to be honest i i think i'm very nervous about it um and um yeah fiona said um whatever tier we're in before the christmas relaxation that's what we go back to afterwards so that's the current plan um but i my i think we'll see some of their thinking is they may start to say well actually what we're going to do before christmas is say these areas that are currently in tier three could come down but they're going to come down after christmas rather than have a small window of everyone changing just before christmas i don't know but we'll see what the next week uh, how the next week plays out um, there are a series of meetings over the next couple of days uh between the councils government directs the public health the chief medical officer all of these things happening where we'll get a bit more information um so alison said some care homes have been told not to put up decorations yeah as i have to say that wouldn't didn't come from me and i haven't seen it in any guidance so um holly may if we can put that for an action just to touch base with our social care colleagues but i'm not aware of anything that prohibits them frankly um other than fire regs because things like tinsel super flammatory um super flammable uh i think we're up to the last question from ante um do we know which vaccines the uk has purchased for use given there are several available so my memory of this ante is what we've bought as a government is uh, the pfizer vaccine which is the first one to be through the regulator so that one's already on shore and being distributed we've bought uh, doses of the astrazeneca oxford vaccine which is made in the uk we bought doses of the moderna vaccine which is also getting through the last uh, level and then the final one is the sputnik vaccine now that one i don't know if we bought any of uh, which i think is the russian uh, one that's the only one that i don't know whether we bought but we definitely bought the other three um, and they are now all going through um, and Magda asked the question, um, which is why why is it all gone so fast? Well, there was a really good explanation I saw about this. So, um, in normal times, if you want to develop a vaccine, you have to uh, make a business case for why you want to develop it. So you've basically got to say to the pharma companies, got to say, is this worth investing money in? Do enough people have the disease? Is it cost effective? Are we going to sell enough doses? So first of all, is there a business case for exploring this? Um, then when you do the research trials, each time you do a research trial, you have to apply for permission to do the research trial and you've got to get the funding to do it and you've got to recruit people. And then you've got to find a part of the world where there's enough of the, the disease going on to give the vaccine to people to see whether it protects them. So what happened back in, I think, February, actually, was uh, governments around the world said, basically, here's a blank check. If you want to go and research vaccines, you can have whatever money it needs. Um, 
we will work with you to make sure all of the approvals work quickly the trials can happen in different countries so again what would normally happen is you'd have a trial in the uk then you'd have a trial in south africa then you'd have a trial in south america and that isn't what happened this time because all the governments of the world were working together for example the um, Pfizer vaccine was trialed in South Africa, Brazil, the UK and America, I think it was, and Europe simultaneously. So rather than them having to wait and do it in turn, they all did it at the same time. So that meant that everything's moved faster. So it hasn't been that any of the red tape's been skipped. What it's meant is that the people on the other side have said yes and the money's been there rather than normally what would happen is everyone would kind of look in the bank and go oh, not sure we can afford it etc etc the other thing that's made this much faster is that um because coronavirus in different parts of the world has been um, still going in high numbers when it's got to the stage of the vaccine trials where you need to find a country where there's lots of the virus and so you can give the vaccine to see whether it works in real world situations. Um, that hasn't been a problem because there have been plenty of countries and those countries have said, yes, come and trial it here. So again, that's helped. So it's really been that um, everyone in the world wanted this to happen. So people didn't have to argue the case. It wasn't, uh, you know, you didn't have to fight. Um, funding was made available. And because there was global partnership, we could run the trials in multiple parts of the world at the same time, which rather than having to go one after another. And that's made everything a lot faster. So nothing's been skipped, but it's been a lot easier to get people to say yes than you would have uh, any, at any other time. The other thing that I would just finally say on that, and the MHRA were, were talking about this the weekend, the reason we've approved Pfizer faster than anyone else is that the MHRA set up an agreement at the beginning of the vaccine processes with the companies to say they would share their data in real time as it came through. And what normally happens is that you wait until all the trials are done and then the regulator gets a massive dump of data. So they get loads of basically files of spreadsheets and they have to spend a long time looking each one of the studies individually. What's happened this time is that each time a, a trial's been run, each time a study's been run, that's gone straight to the regulator in real time. So rather than waiting and trying to wade through all of them together, they've been able to do them as they come. So that means when we got to the final stage, MHRA said, well, actually, we've seen all these trials as they happen. We've gone back through and just double check nothing's changed. But we, we've done the hard work over the last six to seven months. So we're able to make a decision much, much faster. And, and I think that was, you know, that's a, really helped us move much faster. So I think we're just about at time, aren't we, uh, Holly May? Um, and I think I've covered all the questions as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Justin. And thank you to absolutely everyone that asked a question. Um, it's great to hear that the case rates are going down in many wars and there's so much amazing work happening around Birmingham at the moment. I just want to thank every single one of you, regardless of your ward, um, for helping us with this. I mean, it's amazing how you could share information, perhaps somebody in your community, then, then they'll share it and, you know, they'll share it again. So, you know, please, let's keep up, up the momentum um, and let's keep sharing reliable, up-to-date information. Um, and as Justin said, we have potentially got some, you know, some harder months coming up. So we really must continue with this. And if there is anything we can do to help, you know, as I said at the beginning of this webinar, please do email us. Um, if, if you think it would be useful to have a webinar on a certain topic or there's a question that you're really struggling to answer um, in your community, please do email us. I and mean, we, we are more than happy um, to help you. Um, Jack, do you mind popping the email again in, in the chat box to everybody? That'd be great. Thank you. And Holly May, are, are we at 500 yet? <laughs> yes, we are. We are. Yay. Woo! So that's, that's the first landmark for the champions. So my ambition is we get to 1,500 champions. So, you know, if you're finding this helpful, you're finding it useful, help recruit more champions as well get people on more side because I really want us to get to 1,500 but I'm so pleased that we've got to 500 
Um, it's brilliant to see so many people joining us and helping us. Um, so thank you to everyone from me because it, you know, it's what you guys are doing out with your friends and family, with your networks, getting this information out. That's what's having an impact. That's what's helping to bring the numbers down. So please keep at it uh, and please help us uh, recruit more as well because it's great to, to break through that 500 threshold. It is. It's, it's really good. Thank you, Justin. Um, and as Justin also said, so we've got a really good shopping safety graphic um, that you can sort of print as a poster or you can even share it perhaps by WhatsApp if you like. And um, so we will share that with you um, in an email tomorrow. We've also got like a, a make Christmas sort of safe as possible type graphic, which is really good as well. So we'll also share that with you as well. Um, Finally, from me, as I mentioned earlier, we have got a guest webinar next week with West Midlands Police. And um, they're going to cover a topic on enforcement. And again, there'll be a sort of a presentation and then a Q&A at the end for you all um, to ask your questions. Um, so keep an eye out for those details that we sent over to you probably tomorrow in the, in the same email. Um, but that's everything from us. I just want to say thank, thank you so much. Thank you for, to everyone that's joined and welcome to all the, all the new champions. And have a lovely evening. Thank you very much, everybody.